Well, since the days of President Dwight Eisenhower. Any of you guys alive back then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> since the days of President Eisenhower, the Pew Research Center has been asking Americans the same question, which is this. Do you trust the government always or most of the time? Do you trust the... I heard someone say never. Do you always or, or most of the time trust the government? Well, on that, how would you compare... How do you think that if you were to just picture what a chart looks like of Americans' trust in government in the days of Eisenhower versus in 2019, where do you, how do you think that would look? Well, despair not, because I will give you the opportunity to see the graph of 50, 60 years of research, if we could show this line chart of public trust in government. So there it is. You can see the administrations across the top, Nixon, Ford, Carter, etc., and all the way from 1950s on to today. And which direction is it going? Now, you guys are crazy surprised by that, aren't you? No one's surprised by that. No one's surprised that only it's about 20% of people, actually, that's kind of high to me, uh, that 20% of the people always or usually trust the government. But here's what I would say surprised me. What surprised me in looking at this information was that there was a time in recent American history that 80% of Americans always or most of the time trusted the government. Would you say a few things have changed since then? And looking through the history, you can kind of see when they changed, and you can see, oh, there's a little Vietnam War in there, and there's a little Watergate in there, and, and there's a little 2008 Great Recession, and these different influencing factors in people's trust in the government. And I'm imagining that the impeachment proceedings of 2019 probably aren't going to help this graph very much. You got half the nation that thinks the president needs to be impeached because he can't be trusted. You got half the nation that thinks, well, I can't trust the process for impeaching the president. But at the end of the day, it's like, no, it's like at least the one thing we can all agree on is it's corrupt in D.C. and there are people we can't trust. <laughs> at least most people seem to agree on that. So how does it make you feel when you think about these things? How does it make you feel when you see the constant 24-7 news cycle or new tweet or new headline or whatever it is, and it's screaming negativity in your face? I don't know about you, but I have to really try. I have to really try not to be discouraged when I think about our nation's political situation, when I think about all the things that are taking place. It's hard for me not to be discouraged. Do you ever find yourself there? Well, uh, today we're starting a new series, and in, in this series, and, and today what I want to do, today what I want to do is I want to give you kind of what I go to to help me not be discouraged, and not just what I go to, I want to look at what God's Word has to say about why we can be all optimistic, regardless of what's happening in D.C., regardless of who's elected, but it's not just going to be politics. It's regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of chaos and turmoil and circumstances and injustices that you suffer and situations in which you feel stuck, why can we continue to feel optimistic despite the circumstances around us? That's what we're going to look at today. Uh, this is part of a new series David mentioned a moment ago called Who's Who? Who's Who? And, uh, and this is a section we're continuing in the book of Acts. It's a story of the life of the Apostle Paul. And uh, in these last four chapters of the book of Acts, there's a shift where Paul is getting these incredible opportunities to testify before kings and queens and magistrates and, and all these kind of higher-ups, the who's who of his day. And that's kind of how the last four chapters of Acts play out, even though Paul himself is in prison. And so our big idea throughout this series is going to be that the who's who of today is the who's that of tomorrow. But you could also look at the inverse, and that is the who's that of today is the who's who of eternity. God has a different estimation of things. God sees things differently than we see things. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24, if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We're going to pull the words up on the screen. I want to fill you in on what's happening uh, so far just kind of in the story. We saw this last week that the Apostle Paul 
was arrested. It was a sham that he was arrested. He didn't deserve to be arrested. Uh, his incredible crime that he was committing was the crime of nothing. He was actually just worshiping in a temple. And, uh, and so they arrested him, charged him with all of this crazy stuff. And, uh, and so the, the Romans rescue Paul from almost getting beaten to death and ship him off to Caesarea, a city that bears the name of Caesar on the coast, about a day's journey away from Jerusalem. And so a big Roman cohort ships Paul off to Caesarea, under the, where he'll be under the jurisdiction of a, of a ruler, of a governor named Felix. And Paul is sent with a letter from the Roman tribune, another one of the Roman officials named Lysias. This is told in chapter 23. And when you read the letter, on the surface it seems like it's a fine letter, he's just sharing some facts, but if you actually read the story, you can see that Lysias is pretty interested in making himself look good. He's doing a little political posturing. He's, he's revealing himself as being this sort of mix of Superman and Sherlock Holmes. He came in to save the day, when in reality... And we saw this last week when in reality the Apostle Paul was almost crippled for life or killed because of a misjudgment. They didn't know that he was a Roman citizen, but he fails to mention that in the letter. I share all that because it kind of sets us up for a little bit of the political posturing and the political environment that will surrep, excuse me, surround, that was crazy, the story that we're about to read. So with that said, Acts 24 Verses 1 through 9, the Apostle Paul in Caesarea, Felix has now received the letter, and he's called all the interested parties. He's called, uh, he's called the who's who of Jerusalem, the high priest himself, Ananias, the, the biggest kind of movers and shakers in Jerusalem. Felix, the, the ruler, is there. His wife, Queen Drusilla, she was known to be the most beautiful woman in Palestine. Uh, she, uh, well, I could go on about her, more on her next week, but uh, all the big players are there. There's also a guy named Tertullus, an articulate lawyer who's there to prosecute against the Apostle Paul, and then, of course, Paul's there. So picture the scene, this royal court, these who's who, these big-name people, and then a handcuffed Jew named Paul. So chapter 24, verse 1. It says, and after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, their lawyer, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through, uh, saying, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to de detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Remember what town was Jesus from? Nazareth. So that's what they called Christians at that time. Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. So why don't we just stop there for a moment, and I just want to point out what we're beginning to see, but what especially we'll continue to see as we read this story, and it's also our first point for, the, for today, and that is that corruption in politics is not a new phenomenon, it's, it's, it's as old as time. Corruption in politics is not a new phenomenon, it's as old as time. Okay, now I'm not telling you this because not, like, you necessarily didn't know this, but I think we need to be reminded of this. And we can see it here in the story. Tertullus, as he, uh, as he begins, he's making this case, he begins with flattery. And if you don't know the, the history and the story behind it, you might not immediately identify it as flattery, but he's saying to Felix, you've done an incredible job at establishing, establishing peace in our jurisdiction in our land. But if you know the history, this wasn't a time of peace for the Jews at all. One, they were, oppressed, they were an oppressed people. Because of that oppression, there were lots of revolutionaries, would-be messiahs, insurrections, and Felix had developed a reputation 
for with cruel force crushing any form of rebellion. His police force was known for being trigger happy. He had murdered thousands of Jews in his day. I mean, this would be like, okay, much, much bigger scale, okay, much bigger scale. But can you imagine a Jewish person saying, most excellent Adolf, we thank you for what you've done for our nation. Like, you can't imagine, it is so ridiculous. Like, this would have actually sounded ridiculous to everyone's ears, except Felix, who's like, yes, I am an awesome guy. <laughs> okay, so first of all, you begin with flattery. But then he gets to downright deception, outright lies, when he says Paul's profaning the temple. Paul wasn't profaning the temple, Paul was just in the temple. But what happens is because you have Tertullus, this articulate lawyer, and because you now have the who's who of Jerusalem and these higher-ups, Felix has everything to gain by giving the Jews what they want. I mean, who doesn't want to score a few political points? And what does he have to gain by giving Paul what he wants? What does he have to gain by actually issuing a just decree? He has nothing at all. He gets nothing. Why would he displease these constituents who've traveled all the way from Jerusalem, sent their most powerful delegation? Why would he displease them for one handcuffed dude that nobody cares about? How much chances would you give Paul in this situation? Well, if it was a wise and just political ruler, maybe an okay chance. Unfortunately, that's not what Felix was known for. I've already referred to his brutal police force, but... Uh, but there's more to this story of Felix. I'll tell you a little bit. Felix was actually unique as a ruler because he was the only, Ro or he was the first Roman ruler who got his start as a slave. He started as a slave, and because of a favor and a connection, the emperor at the time, Claudius, set him free from slavery, and he uh, and he ultimately became the ruler of this section, uh, of or this area of uh, of ancient Israel. And so you would think that having come from such a background and having been a down-and-outer himself, that coming in contact with a down-and-outer like Paul, he might show compassion. But that was the opposite of the kind of person that he was. This is what one historian has to say about him. Uh, speaking of Felix, he says, Felix indulged in every license and every act excess, thinking that he could do every evil act with impunity. There are no consequences. I can do whatever I want. Now what chances would you give the Apostle Paul? Now doesn't this kind of sound like modern day life when you think about politics? People who serve their own interests, people who treat defenseless individuals like, like bargaining chips and, and just I can do whatever I want whenever I want with impunity. Doesn't that sound a little bit like the way the political world works these days? Here's why I think this is important, and here's why I think it's important to keep coming back to this thing that you know, but we need to be reminded of, and that is that corruption in politics is not a new phenomenon. It's as old as time. I think something that's happened since the days of Eisenhower, how many of you have heard of American exceptionalism? You guys ever heard that phrase before? Where there was a time in history where it was thought that America is the greatest nation that has ever existed. We are exceptional in every way. We're beautiful, we're great, we're amazing. But now, and I think it's partly because of this 24-7 news cycle, I think it's partly because of the social media and it's constantly in our face, it's like we have a whole new kind of American exceptionalism. We've gone from we are the greatest nation that has ever existed to suddenly we are the worst. Okay, I will be the first to admit I believe there's corruption in D.C. I think there's a lot of corruption in D.C., and sometimes I let it discourage me. But sometimes I just have to go to God's Word and just get a little perspective. We are not the most terrible nation in human history. This is not the most corrupt environment that has ever existed. I mean, we're talking about a time when just... A few decades prior, Jesus was crucified under Roman rule for doing nothing except preaching, didn't have a real trial. It was a kangaroo court. They cast him out. They crucified him. Pilate, the governor, washed his hand, pretend it wasn't his fault at all, and just because a mob demanded it, they hung a man on a cross without actually being convicted of a crime. 
okay? I mean, I'm pretty sure you could probably make an argument that as much corruption as there is in our politics today, that Rome had something on us, probably. And if you want to get a little taste for corruption in politics, talk to our missionary to Kenya, okay? He actually, when he comes here, he's, it's like he gets this fresh of breath, or this breath of fresh air, like, man, this is amazing, like, <laughs> the, the amount of corruption and fraud that they've had to deal with. And so I think it helps us get a little per perspective. And I think that's one of the first things that we've got to do. We've got to get perspective because, you know what, the news makes money by being sensational. They get, make money by making things as negative and as terrible and as crazy as could be. But we have good news in Jesus, and he's the one our hope is in. So let's keep reading the story. We're going to come back to... Uh, so we just finished in verse 9. Tertullus has given his, uh, his account, his prosecution against the Apostle Paul. He's laid his charges. And if you read in verses 10 and following, what you'll see is Paul's defense. And Paul just has this completely level head. He's completely rational, shares this incredible logic. Like, if this world was not a corrupt world, if it was a logical and reasonable and just world... Any court would have said, okay, yeah, we're letting this guy go free. But we don't live in a pure, innocent world, do we? And justice doesn't always happen in this life, does it? So Paul presents his defense, and I love this. The final thing, uh, the final thing he says in verse, uh, verse 21, it says... Um, he says, I'm not guilty of anything else except this one thing, that while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you this day. He's like, I didn't do, I didn't profane any temple. I didn't start a riot. All I did was place my hope in resurrection. Problem with that? I love it because he's resting his case on resurrection, and then he just finishes. And then we pick up what happens next in verse 22. It says, but Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, so that was another name for Christianity, was the way. So, he, so Felix was actually pretty knowledgeable about Christianity. It says, he put them off, saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurions that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, he was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I, uh, when I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Felix is this perpetual delayer. He's delaying judgment on Paul, and now he's delaying a decision about what he's going to do about Jesus. He didn't need more time. He had an accurate knowledge of the way. He understood what Paul was saying, but Felix was not a good dude. He, he was, in fact, his wife, Drusilla, this was the result of an adulterous affair. He seduced her away from another king and took her for himself. And so when Paul's speaking about judgment and a judgment day, he starts to get a little squeamish seat, sitting on that throne. Okay, And I love that like, while everybody else is like, they're, they're you know, trading political favors and flattering one another, Paul's like, you're going to be judged. <laughs> like, like when you know where your hope is, you can be a truth speaker. And you can let the trip, chips fall wherever they may. And I think there's some people in this room right now where God's called you to speak truth into a certain situation. Maybe you've been a little flattering. Maybe you've just been kind of keeping it above the surface, but somebody needs to hear the truth from you. And so Paul shares the truth. Felix says, go away. Verse 26, at the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, the next ruler. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. What in the world? When I read that phrase, two years, I'm like, what? I mean, earlier we read Acts chapter 16 and studied and talked about this. Earlier in the year, Paul has this miraculous jailbreak. We're talking about an apostle who sees like miracle and deliverance and rescue one after another. Where was God here? 
Where was God when Paul was left in prison for two years? And some of us in this room are saying, where, God, were you when I called on you in this situation and that situation? When you read the text, you get this feeling like, oh, this sickening feeling like, God lets Felix have that kind of power? This bad, corrupt politician gets to decide the fate of God's preeminent apostle on the earth? Lord, what are you doing? That's not even fair. And that gives rise to our next point. It's really the main point for the day that everything kind of builds toward and flows out of. I think it's the main point of the passage, too, and it's this. Our fate is not in the hands of powerful people, but of an all-powerful God. Our fate is not in the hands of powerful people, but in the hands of an all-powerful God. On the surface, Paul's fate was in the hands of powerful people. On the surface, his his fate was in the hands of Felix, who on a whim can decide to do the Jews a favor. His fate is in the hands of the Jewish leaders who are exerting their political influence against him. There's nothing about this story on the surface that looks like God is in control. It looks like bad, corrupt politicians are in control, wouldn't you say? And it looks that way in your life sometimes, too. Sometimes it looks like that boss who's not showing favor towards you maybe doesn't like you very much and is exerting pressure upon you. Sometimes it looks like that person is the one that determines your fate. Sometimes it looks like the college that didn't admit you or the legal system that ruled against you or that person who holds the key to your heart. It looks like they have all the power. But the message of this story is that our fate isn't in the hands of powerful people but of an all-powerful God. And I want to show you that last part, that our fate is in the hands of a powerful God. I want to show you the story behind the story, the story beneath the surface, and it comes from earlier in the book of Acts. Earlier in the book of Acts, we talked about this, and we told, we, I told the story of it last week. The Apostle Paul, remember, he, right now he's apostle of life. He's sharing the message of life with people. Back then he was an apostle of death. He went around killing Christians and, uh, and uh, persecuting them and putting them in prison. And so back then, uh, that's what the Apostle Paul was, but then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. I think it makes sense why Christianity is called the way. He met Jesus on his way, and this morning God wants to meet some of you on your way. He meets Jesus, and one of the things that Jesus communicates in that passage is that Paul, and this is a quote, Acts 9.15, Paul is my chosen instrument to preach before Gentiles and kings. Paul was a chosen instrument to preach before Gentiles and kings. And so when you read this story that God just abandoned his apostle in prison for two years, on the surface, that's the story. In reality, prison wasn't an interruption to God's plan. It was actually part of God's plan and how he fulfilled his purpose in Paul's life. Does that mean God delights in Paul being in prison? By no means. But there weren't a whole lot of Christians in power. Christianity in the early days, it spread amongst the poor. It spread amongst the riffraff. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 1. So how is God going to reach a whole world that he loves? How's God going to reach these who's who at the very top? He's going to use a handcuffed Jew named Paul, and he's going to reach these people and open a door of mercy where they slammed the door of injustice and locked them up in prison. How might God want to do the same thing for you? Obviously, you're not in a physical prison right now, but in what ways do you feel stuck this morning? In what ways do you feel like, uh, like you're confined, like you just... You're just reliant on other people to do something for you, to get you out of this situation, or you're just reliant upon this situation to change. How might God want to use your stuckness to reveal his goodness? And how might God want to open your eyes to see this supposed interruption as an opportunity for him to display his mercy? Think about your trial right now. Look at it with a different set of eyes. How might God actually use this for good? Our fate is not in the hands of powerful people, but of an all-powerful God. He's the one working behind the scenes. Can you see it? How many of you have heard of a guy named uh, Pastor Andrew Brunson? You guys ever heard of this guy before? Okay, maybe if I say it like this. Christian missionary arrested in Turkey 
kept in prison for 735 days a couple years ago. Anybody remember that now? Okay, now you now you're like, well, that was his name, Andrew Brunson. Okay, so uh, you can put a picture of Andrew Brunson up on the screen if you can. There he is. That's him actually getting out of prison. So Andrew Brunson was an evangelical pastor, and God had given him uh, a mission and a passion for reaching tons of people in Turkey. He'd been there since the late 90s. He had no reason to suspect that anything was wrong. He wasn't going around starting an inter- insurrection or a riot or anything. He's just going about his everyday business, lived there with his wife, and then suddenly they're like, you're under arrest. He's like, this must be a mistake. And they say, no, you're under arrest for insurrection. You're under arrest for conspiring to overthrow the government. They actually had these charges. They thought that the CIA and the Mormons were cooperating with him to start an insurrection. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's a strange partnership. So <laughs> Mitt Romney, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, Sorry, I don't know. But So they have all these crazy accusations against them. You know, you're in prison for a few days. You're thinking, like, I'm an American. God, you know, I'm going to get out of this. This is going to be all right. Well, then you're in for longer and longer. They end up releasing his wife and longer and longer and longer. And he talks about this. He did an interview just a few weeks ago for Christianity Today, and he talked about it. And as the days wore on, he started to lose any amount of faith, faith in the American government to rescue him, faith in maybe some good-hearted prison warden, faith in anyone or anything. And it wasn't until... He hit rock bottom. He describes himself as suicidal and depressed at the time. It wasn't until he hit rock bottom and had nothing else to lean on that he leaned on God and his brokenness and his humility. And God didn't change his circumstances right away. In fact, it took a long time for his circumstances to change. He's out now. But It was in that brokenness and humility and coming to God in his weakness that God began to, for starters, open his eyes to see things different. For starters, what he started to see was that prison wasn't an interruption, it was actually an opportunity. And he went from there and he started to share the gospel with people who never would have heard it. Then they put him in court. And imagine this court scene. It was exactly like what we just read. And he describes it as a kangaroo court and all these ridiculous charges. And he stands up before him and he says, the reason I'm here today is because of faith in Jesus Christ. And he begins to proclaim the gospel to these people who probably didn't know a single Christian. And so he has all these opportunities. But you know, the biggest opportunity, and he reflects upon this later, he didn't see until later. He didn't see until retrospect. And when we're thinking about, when I'm talking about beginning to see what God is doing behind the scenes, when you think about your own story, when you think about your own life, how often do you see what God's doing in the moment versus seeing it in retrospect? God is working in your life whether you see it or not, but oftentimes you can't see it until you're looking back on it. I imagine that the Apostle Paul, it, like on the first day of prison, probably isn't like, I'm here to preach to kings. He was probably like, rescue me from jail, please. But in retrospect, or somewhere along the way, he started to see it, and he started to preach, and he started to see the interruption as an opportunity. And when you begin to see beyond what's on the surface, beyond your prison walls, and beyond the darkness, and beyond the injustice that you've suffered, God begins to open your eyes to see your interruptions as opportunities, and your detours as God's direct path to fulfilling your destiny. And so what happens for Pastor Brunson is God begins to open his eyes to these things. He crawls out of this depression, begins to find his hope in God, begins to share that hope with others, and in time, God opens his prison doors, and you can see it right there. He's getting out of prison, and in time, he's able to reflect back on what God did. And you remember that 24-7 news cycle we've talked about, referenced several times? Often it can be negative, for sure, but God can use anything. And this time, he used it for something positive. God alerted the entire Christian world about how the situation in Turkey had changed, and he raised up millions of people to begin praying for Pastor Brunson, and not only that, but to establish a prayer movement that continues to this day, even though he's released. I want to read you Pastor Brunson's response and how he describes what happened to him in his reflection He says, when God had accomplished what he wanted through my imprisonment, which I think was to raise up millions of people to bless Turkey in prayer, then I was released. So I see God as the grandmaster chess player 
behind all of the political intrigue, God was really in charge. Our fate is not in the hands of powerful people, but of an all-powerful God. How is God being a grandmaster chess player in your life? And we've all heard that saying, there are two sides to every story. I would also say, and Pastor Brunson talks about this, but I would also say there are two realities. There are two realities to every story. There's on the surface and behind the scenes. On the surface and behind the scenes. We've seen this in the life of Pastor Brunson. He thought he was a bargaining chip. God says, no, you're a catalyst for a global prayer movement. He thought it was an interruption. No, it was actually an opening of doors of mercy to Muslim prisoners. We saw this in the life of the Apostle Paul. His fate was apparently being decided by people in power, but the reality behind the scenes was that the people in power, their fate was being decided by how they responded to God's messenger. There's a whole different story going on behind the scenes, and what I want to ask you is which story are you paying attention to? Which story is driving your attitudes and actions? Is it what is on the surface? Is it your dark prison cell? Is it the situation in which you're stuck? Is it the fact that it feels like you're pausing in this period of interruption? Or is it the behind-the-scenes reality that God has worked, even if you can't see how he's working, that he is at work? And that's what faith looks like. It doesn't look like God giving you the step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all laid out for the rest of your life. I mean, who does God ever do that for? Nobody. He's not going to do that. Some of us, God's given a vision. He's given a dream. He's shown us a destiny, but he doesn't show us how to get here. I don't know how Paul would have responded if on day one God said, yeah, you're going to preach from kings, but it's going to be in jail. There's a reason God doesn't give us the whole download at once because we'd probably be like, oh, I, I just kind of don't want to do that then. We'd back out and say that it was too hard. He shows us step by step by step by step in the context of a friendship with him. And so which reality are you paying attention to? Above the surf, or on the surface or behind the scenes? And so to bring it full circle to sort of the political discussion that we began with, this is what I personally try to remind myself of. I remind myself that even with all the chaos and the sometimes just discouraging news, that, 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 that never stopped God in the past from intervening. That back in 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Paul was living, the corrupt politics of their day didn't stop God from taking his preeminent apostle on the earth to have a timeout and spend in prison for two years in order to testify those people. And the corruption of ancient Rome and the political, religious, strange, crazy mixture that was taking place in Jerusalem didn't stop God from sending his son into the world, not just to suffer under political injustice and oppression and corruption, but actually to use it to accomplish the redemption of the whole world. And sometimes I hear these sort of doomsday prophets talking about God's judgment on America and we're all going to hell in a handbasket and it's just going to be terrible and America's going up in flames and there's no hope for us. And I'm like, no, no. Because Rome was just as corrupt, more corrupt, and look what God did then. And what would prevent God from doing the very same thing today? 2,000 years ago, God sent his son into this world, and he lived and suffered and was oppressed under the system. On the surface, he was just an ordinary guy. Behind the scenes, to those of faith we saw, he was the son of God. On the surface, he was a revolutionary soapbox preacher, but behind the scenes, behind the scenes, he was more than that, more than a preacher. He was the king of the universe. They didn't see it. They crucified him. And the world doesn't see it. They can't see it unless the church shares that hope with them. Three days later, he rose from the, from the grave. And just like the Apostle Paul, we as Christians place our hope, rest our case on resurrection. Our hope is not in what our eyes see. Our hope is not in what's on the surface. Our hope is what's behind the scenes, behind the stone that covered Jesus' tomb. Our hope 
is in the resurrection of Jesus because Jesus is alive. He's working in your prison. He's working in your darkness. He's working in this dark political climate. God is at work when we can't see it with our eyes. Even atheists can see with their eyes. But we see with eyes of faith. God is working right now because Jesus is alive.